By way of introduction, I want to tell you that uh, my father was ill some years ago and was in the hospital and ended up in a, one of these nursing homes, which I visited frequently. And there was a woman in this nursing home who walked around constantly, an elderly woman, who kept saying over and over, who am I? Where am I? Does anybody know? Does anybody care? <clears throat> and then after she said this repeatedly, she came and up to me. I was sitting at a chair at a table, and I said, you're here. You're here. And she regarded that to be an incredibly calming comment, like somebody recognized her existence, finally, after all the walking around in that nursing home. So I kind of feel like that's my story, too. <laughs> and that I've been uh, walking around uh, issuing those same four questions and haven't had much response. So to me, this, this surprise is a great calming, has a great calming influence on me because I was, I was wondering whether I really existed or not. <laughs> so suddenly you told me I'm here. And uh, what I want to do is do today a little bit of salesmanship with regard to what I call S failures. My, my basic point is that there's statistical uncertainty, which you learn in the econometrics courses, but there's also model ambiguity. If you want a, a reference, it's, uh, it's Knight's distinction between risk and uncertainty, although I never remember which is which. So I tend to use the word uncertainty and ambiguity. Uncertainty is a statistic, statistical error, and ambiguity comes from the fact that you and I don't know the model that is appropriate for studying this data set. And uh, the uh, exploration of ambiguity comes from a sensitivity analysis in which you demonstrate how much the conclusions you make depend upon the assumptions. So my goal is to have <coughs> every uh, regression where you have that column of T values, that represents the statistical uncertainty. I'd like to have added to that a column of S values that represent the sturdiness of the coefficient. Namely, if you change the model very much, do you get a totally different uh, conclusions with regard to that coefficient? So I'm gonna illustrate that, I'm gonna start slow, uh, and then move into what I think some things are psychologically disturbing, namely Bayesian thinking, and then talk about some of the uh, mathematics that lies behind that. So I hope that when I start slow, you'll kind of get the message. I, I uh, started this when I was a graduate student at Michigan. I did a, an undergraduate degree in mathematics and I did a PhD in, in economics at Michigan and a master's in statistics where I, I was studying Bayesian statistics, master's in uh, at mathematics. One of the uh, parts of that study include uh, Bayesian statistics. And um, I, 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 at the same time, was studying uh, e economics in this, in this building at Michigan. The Michigan Economics Building at that time had three floors and a basement. And the econometric theory was taught in the top floor, on the third floor. And the dirty work of building a macroeconomic forecasting model was done in the basement. And to me, I, I just couldn't understand the disconnect between what was being described in the top floor, all this stuff about T-values and standard errors and a biasness, compared to the mess that was going on down to the bottom in order to create a model that they can use for forecasting the, the economy. And that disconnect has been troubling me for a long time. So I wrote my PhD dissertation about that and, talk, and called it Specification Searches, the name of the book Specification Searches. And my view is there's uh, six different types now, that's all I'm going to say about that. You've got to go out and buy that book. It's very expensive now. It's a classic. But the one we're going to talk about today is interpretive searches. These have to do with the fact that uh, you're not sure about which control should, should, you should add into your regression. And you have attitudes of what we have expectations with regard to what's the, a proper, a suitable statistical model that lends its, uh, itself to the kinds of interpretation you'd like to make with the data. So we're, you're, studying, you're studying multiple models in an attempt to interpret the data. The statistical theory says you go have one go around. You estimate the model and you have all the properties that that has. But real analysis, real, real data analysis involves estimating tens, hundreds, thousands, if you think of it as the, the whole the economics uh, profession has been estimating tens and tens and thousands of regressions with the same data set. <coughs> um, so I'd, I'd like to argue that transparency is not enough. So suppose that you estimate a regression model and you only estimate one and you report that fully. I estimate it's a thousand, I don't know, a thousand, 
and I end up with the same one that you did, and I report every step along the way, therefore making it transparent, apparently transparent. Well, should you and I make the same inferences from the data? And how do you, how do you as a reader help to make that, how, how do you make that call as to whether that process by which the person went through the thicket of models, whether that, pros, that process has an impact on the inferences that they make, that you should make? So that's the question here. And I'm, I don't think that you should make the same inferences because you're revealing different attitudes about what generated the data. The first person has no doubt about it. The second person has a lot of doubt and has a lot of statistical uncertainty that comes with that doubt, but also model ambiguity, both of which have to be recognized and built into it in order to turn transparency into accountability. It's not enough just to see what somebody has done. You've got to know how to map what they've done into just measures of statistical uncertainty and measures of model ambiguity. So, um, and, and I guess I've already said there's two sources of model error. There's statistical uncertainty and model ambiguity. I'm going to do S values. S stands for sturdy. And then uh, T, uh, T values in, is an uh, unfamiliar measure of model ambiguity. I, I proved this long ago. I don't know how many of you know that, but if you don't like the sign of a coefficient in your regression, the way to change it is to omit a variable with a bigger T value. If you omit a variable with a smaller T value, you can't have a change in the sign of that coefficient. How many knows that? You don't know that. So the, the message is that the t values are somehow not only a measure of statistical uncertainty, but also model ambiguity, meaning that the variables that have high, the coefficients with high t values tend to be sturdy in a sense you can't change the sign by omitting other variables. So keep that in mind. A big question is whether s values and t values are different, or whether T values are equal to S values, but with a different interpretation, meaning you're still going to work with a sufficient statistic, the T value, and use that for multiple purposes. In this case, you'd, you, the uh, T value traditionally is, comp is compared with a number like 2. T values tend to rise as sample size increases. This is all comparison, so you compare one T value with the other. So this problem doesn't go away as the sample size increases, for example. So to kick this thing off, let's start, um, oh, I already said that. That's what I just said, huh? I'm anticipating myself. Um, and let's start with a two-variable regression. So we're going to work with, uh-oh, uh somehow this guy, this must be an apple, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, um, we're going we're gonna to deal with a two-variable, uh, a regression with two explanatory variables. And uh, we're going to normalize the data set so that everything has unit variance, unless there's only three sufficient statistics. There's a sample size, but the three sufficient statistics are the correlation between the two explanatory variables and the correlation between a dependent variable and an explanatory variable. There's two of those. those the first two, the se that's pair I'm going to call R1 and R2. That's a correlation between Y and the Xs. And the correlation is going to be rho. So we're going to build a sturdiest measure, a measure built on those three parameters. So here's the result, which is that, um, that that arrow pointing downward is a backward slash. That means, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, that's a uh, subscript. So the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for B1 and R1 to have the same, same sign. So R1 is the simple regression. And B1 is the regression controlling for the other variable. R1 is just the direct measured simple correlation. B1 is the, is the partial correlation controlling for the other variable. So we're asking whether when you omit the other variable, do you get a change in sign? The answer is you, you don't if the product of the ratio of R2 over R1 times rho is less than 1. So that becomes the sturdiest measure. The ratio of the correlations, it's also the ratio of the t-values times the correlation. So, at th then the, so this is like a multicollinearity measure. You want to put it that way. How does collinearity affect the sign of your, of your uh, coefficient? You're interested in sign sturdiness here. And it's not surprising, therefore, that if rho is small, then you're in a happy situation in which it, the, the coefficients are going to be sturdy. But there's two other things that are kind of unusual. If rho is the opposite sign of R2 over R1, so the, uh, the odd thing is if the... 
You want to do that? Yeah, let's do that. Take a second to switch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'll compete with the th I'll complete the thought here, which is the it's it's not surprising that the correlation plays in a role that you just saw. But the odd thing is that the correlation is opposite the sign of the ratio of the T virus. That's dirty too. And finally, if you're and I said that before, if you're if T1 is big compared to T2, that makes coefficient one to sturdy one. So I want to I want to uh, communicate what seems an odd kind of result with a visual display, which the economists would be very familiar with, which is basically a preference function of the part of the data. Yeah, that looks much better. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's the same uh, slide that you had a minute ago. So B1 and B2 are the traditional uh, core. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, multi or bivariate regression coefficients, and R1 and R2 are the simple correlations. So I've already said this, the value of R, well, I've already said I want to say. So here, here's, the, uh, here's an image where the, um, <coughs> this is a likelihood ellipse or confidence ellipse. It's centered at the, that B, the least squares estimate, and where you see those uh, tangencies between that at likelihood ellipse and one of the axes, that's a constrained regression, where you maximize the likelihood function subject to the either beta one or beta two being zero. So you can see that this is a case where R1 and R2 are in the same quadrant as B. There's no sign change, and it doesn't matter what the ratio of, of uh, R1 and R2 is. The reason is because the, the likelihood ellipse points away from the origin. It says if you want a smaller B1, we want a bigger B2. So that, that shape of the likelihood function then doesn't, that tends to make sturdiness. You get this idea? So this, and in a multivariate setting, that's extremely hard to, to capture. It's not a simple correlation anymore. It's very hard to capture that, that, that's, that feature. And then uh, the other feature is that the, the, you can have that uh, pointing into the origin rather than so this says if one coefficient is smaller, the other one is smaller too. So if you impose a result that beta two is small, then it comes in with a smaller beta one. But if this one points into the origin, as if that was as, as, the, as if the origin were the preferred point, and therefore you get the shrinkage directly into the origin, you don't get a sign change. That's, where, that's the case where R1 and R2 are similar in size. Even though it, it, the correlation is the opposite, it's similar in size. And then this is the case where you get the sign change, where it points in kind of to the, to the edge of the origin. So the constrained estimate is not in the same quadrant. So I, I want to do is generalize this in a, in a way which is uh, probably unfamiliar. This stuff should be all very familiar to you, although maybe you're not used to this geometry. I don't know. I tend to like a visual display. I think I'm a visual thinker. I think most students are visual thinkers as well. Uh, so I'm going to have, a, uh, well, we don't need to dwell on that. I'm going to have the, the t value is the estimate divided by half the length of the confidence interval. I'm going to create ranges of estimates that are supportable by this data set, but given a range of models, and find a maximum estimate and a minimum estimate. The s value is the center of that of that interval divided by half the length, completely analogous to the t-value. So an s in, in, a, in excess of 1 means that you've got a sturdy coefficient. You're not going to find a sign change within the range of the models being considered. Um, well, I'm, I have some conjecture. Some people have more mathematical ability than I do. I've thought about this for a long time. I've read Gantmacher many times trying to figure out exactly which theorem could help me prove this. But the multidimensional version of that, what I saw you before, is what I showed you before is very difficult to work with because you're talking about now two to the k regressions and the sign patterns that the two to the k regressions can take on are very complex. So now let's talk, let's talk about multivariate regression with soft constraints. This is where we're going to start talking about Bayesian inference. So this is the regression setting that we're talking about, a multivariate normal setting with mean x beta where x is a vector and beta is a coefficient, the target coefficient, and sigma squared i, the standard regression setting, and the least squares estimate is built into your head, x prime x inverse x prime y, it's like saying the alphabet, <laughs> and then the likelihood of contours uh, look like this uh, last item. There are, it's a quadratic form, an ellipse. 
centered at the uh, least squares estimate B. So I, I pose this question, suppose you had two data sets, uh, a, a Y1 and an X and a Y2, and a, and a corresponding X1 and X2. What's the formula for combining two data sets? Well, <coughs> this is standard uh, application of X prime X inverse X prime Y, but with the two data sets. And it turns out to be a matrix weighted average of the two estimates. You have an estimate in the first data set and an estimate in the second data set. Now the thing that's complex is that in a, in a univariate setting, a weighted average lies between the two values. In a multivariate setting, say two-dimensional, two a matrix weighted average can lie anywhere except on the line connecting the two points behind a line. It can lie between the two points, but it can't lie on the line that connects the two. You got what I'm saying? So it's, it's an extremely complicated pooling problem as soon as you get beyond the one-dimensional setting. And you gotta have some kind of way of getting control over this, because that formula operates in very complex ways and produces all kinds of wild estimates if you vary the H1 and H2, if you vary those H matrices. So now I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that the, the uh, H2 is something you make up. So you make up a fictitious data set to add to the data set that you have in front of you. And, and that's what Bayesians do, in effect. They have a prior distribution. They're using contextual information. And trust me, the context always matters. No smart economist is ever going to prevent the context from altering the inferences that are appropriate. In fact, my view is the, the two worst people to do a data analysis are a statistician who doesn't understand the context and a clinician who doesn't understand the statistics. You've got to bring both of those to bear. You, and context matters. If you try to... If you, if you think that you can achieve context-free inferences, maybe in an experimental setting, but it just doesn't, going, not going to happen with the observational data that economists work with. And we're finding out more and more it doesn't, ha doesn't work well in an experimental setting because of heterogeneity, which is, which is a big point about the uh, bits. How, how transferable are the results from one experiment to another setting? So, uh, and that transferability ultimately is going to depend on other variables. You're going to have judgments about what helps you to transfer and what don't. And the result is you're going to have statistical ambiguity that comes from the, the uh, ambiguity about how to do that uh, transfer across uh, settings. So, uh, I, I get tremendous resistance to this idea. The Bayesian idea is really treated with uh, utter disrespect by econometricians. <coughs> and... Uh, I, I, I just think they're stupid. I really do. <laughs> they just don't understand. They live in what I call asymptopia, where uh, the, their theorems operate. But here on Earth, they, they're totally irrelevant. And trust me, all that stuff you learned about T statistics and unbiasedness, that's utterly gone by the time you get to your tenth regression, not to mention your thousandth. You've got to make sense of what economists are actually doing and not pretend you, that you're working in some kind of experimental setting. The, the regression, the statistical analysis that you learned is really appropriate to the sciences where you have control experiments, but not in the observational setting that we're working at because we don't know what the controls are. That's part of the enterprise that you as an analyst brings to bear when you do the data analysis. <coughs> so, uh, here, so here's a picture uh, similar to that what we had before, except now we have a sphere located at the origin. That's the fictitious data set. We've got the actual data set that has some kind of preference function that you can see. And the ideal uh, <coughs> uh, uh, compromise estimates are, lo are along that locus of tangencies between these two indifference curves. And then uh, I've identified a, um, two points along that uh, locus of indifference curve and drawn a circle in there. That's going to be my sturdiness uh, area. So if you, if, you, um, if you look at the, the contract curve, it looks like beta 2 changes sign, but beta 1 does not. It stays in the same sign. The sturdiness measure is going to assume that the, you're, oh, let me back up. I'm not being clear. Uh, you're going to have, uh, rather than, so that the spheres located at origin are going to pull that OLS estimate in toward your origin with a certain gravitational force that depends on how certain you are that the coefficients are zero. 
if you're completely certain you're going to, or nearly so, you're going to shrink that so very rapidly. That means a small standard error. It means a, a fictitious data set that's low, whose means or estimates are all zero with very small standard errors. On the other hand, if you think you don't know very much to begin with and you create a fictitious data set with a lot of noise in it, then you don't shrink as much. So what I'm going to do is impose the assumption that there's an upper bound and a lower bound for the variance matrix that defines your fictitious data set and, and create a set that represents a set of estimates that can be generated using that base formula for all covariance matrices in that interval, where an interval of, of uh, m means that the difference is positive definite. A less than B means that A minus B is positive definite. That's the sense in which there's an interval. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. This is the old, I'm, I've, I've gotten uh, in trouble, I guess, for suggesting the so-called feasible ellipse. That's the whole ellipse of constrained estimates. That's what happens when you don't know the metric or the strength of shrinkage. That's the whole set of estimates that you can produce, the Bayesian estimates. Or it's equivalent to constrained regressions in all possible coordinate systems. And that, as you can see, produces sign changes for everything there's only one quadrant you can't get, which is the quadrant opposite the simple correlations. I don't know if you can see that now, but you can get opposite the OLS, down here, down here in the bottom and on the left. The only one you can't get opposite to is, is the simple correlations. By the way, uh, in addition to S values, I would like to see us elevate the simple correlations and have them always reported when we have run a regression because the partial correlations are something you cooked up by choosing what the controls are. The simple correlations are actually in the data set. And there's a variety of, of, of theoretical reasons why the simple correlation should be retained. But one is this one, that if you play with a set of variables in different coordinate systems, omit variables in different coordinate systems, there's only one uh, sign pattern that cannot be altered. That's the opposite. You can't get the opposite of the simple correlations. So that's real. That's hard stuff. The rest of the stuff is cooked up by you when you chose your controls. Um, <clears throat> I guess this is a repeat. So here's what I was saying before. We're going to have a, uh, an interval of, co of estimates when the, the v, v bigger than V lower star means that V is bounded from above by a lower covariance matrix. So we, you saw before that if the, um, the, the ratio of t-values times the correlation never goes away as the sample size increases. And that's because you're still entertaining the idea, no matter how big the sample size, you're still entertaining the idea of omitting a variable. So at some point, you ought to call that off and say the data set is so strong, I cannot omit that variable. This, the t or something about sample size ought to matter. And that enters in this analysis by a lower bound on a covariance matrix. And likewise, an upper bound on a covariance matrix is required to deal with high dimensionality data sets. Because as you add more and more variables, you're going to dissipate the limited data information over a larger and larger data set. And you've got you to limit the information, that uh, dispersion that comes from those high dimensional data sets. So you really need a lower bound and upper bound. Well, I've said this before. The orthon of the simple correlations is special. I'm going to skip this because I don't want to get into the technical. Orthon of partial correlations is also special. In the, if you have an identity cover, or if you have a diagonal covariance matrix. By the way, um, <coughs> there's another thing that you learn from a Bayesian approach, which is how do you decide which variables to, how do you decide how to define the coordinate system, how to define the variables? So if you use x1 and x2, and I by accident use x1 minus x2 and x1 plus x2, that's the same statistical model. It's just the, the parameters are now different. It's still a linear function of those two variables. And so the question is, in what coordinate system should you omit a variable? Or should you accidentally choose a coordinate system and start omitting variables? The Bayesian answer is, you want to omit variables in coordinate system in which the prior is diagonal, meaning if you tell me something about beta 1, it doesn't alter my opinion about beta 2. And that's something that, you, that is illustrated here. If you have that, if you have that uh, diagonal covariance matrix, if you shrink hard enough, you're going to replicate the simple correlations. Again, a reason to retain the simple correlations. 
I'm S value is going to be proportional to T values. I don't have time to really talk about this. Let's move on. Um, so here, here's a sequence of, uh, of equations that talk about how to, how to use the R squared as a measure of the size of the coefficients. So in a standardized setting, or actually in any setting, the bigger the betas, the bigger will be the R squared, because you're explaining a larger fraction of the, of the variance of the dependent variable. So I'm using that together with the assumption that the upper and lower variance matrices are proportional to the identity matrix to define an upper and lower expected R squared. So all you have to do to use this analysis, and I know you're not understanding this completely, but it's meant to be user friendly, although it's somewhat non-transparent. I can, I can feel it in the audience, but the, the, it's trying to be as minimally expecting you to do something to input the context in a minimal way. Not an ideal way. If this doesn't work for you, then you've got to add more contextual information. But the only context that's expected from you is an upper and lower expected R squared. And then you're often running with uh, upper and lower uh, bounds for the coefficients or model ambiguity measures or S values, all the same thing. <coughs> so here's the uh, reporting style. Let's see if I get this right. So I, I took a look actually at that, uh, I think there's 69 variable regression uh, that explains uh, GDP growth. And it, I think it's 1960 to, I forget exactly, the interval of time. But this started with Robert Barrow and the statisticians that picked it up. Frankly, I think this stuff is kind of nonsensical because the data analysis doesn't have context in there. You've got to have be an economist who understands what determines economic growth in order to make any sense out of this complex data set. You can't expect the statistics to answer that. So I'm confirming that viewpoint, even though there are some statistical analyses that have mostly focused on statistical uncertainty, not on model ambiguity. There are some statistical analyses that suggest that there are certain variables that can, whose effects can be estimated accurately. Anyway, I, I took 14 of these things that I thought would be most important. So you can see them, uh, uh, the first variable is the is the initial condition in terms of per capita GDP initially. And, this, and then the second variable is the, a culture variable, which is the fraction speaking a foreign language. There's a whole bunch of culture variables in the data set. So I picked that one that I thought might make sense. You can object to that, but the, the objection isn't relevant to the illustration. I'm trying to get a, some point across. The first point is the way I would approach this problem is start to uh, cluster the variables in some way to think about alternative ways in which these variables impact things and wouldn't have just run a regression. Anyway, here they are. Um, uh, absolute latitude, which I believe is important. I've already studied some of this because you need to have a high per capita growth rate. You need to attract manufacturing. Manufacturing traditionally been a cold climate kind of activity because it's hard to operate expensive equipment for long hours at high pace in a, in a tropical climate. So I've always thought latitude was important. Anyway, there they are. Um, then, then uh, well, these are the clustering, the, the descriptions of the variables. Then over here on the right, that's the regular OLS regression. At the far left is the simple correlation. And the thing I wanted to bring to your attention is that that first variable has an opposite sign. If, and if this, the simple correlation says the rich get richer, meaning per capita growth rate increases with initial per capita income. But when you control for all the other variables, it turns negative. So you're supposed to be thinking like an economist at this point and recognize that when you control for all those other things, what you've got left over is something like TFP. So this is a measure of technology. So that variable now becomes a, a um, implicit measure of technology transfer. In other words, the whole thing comes alive rather than just a variable. You start as an, an economist, you're supposed to put yourself in this way, into this enterprise that uh, helps us illuminate what's happening. But then, uh, then, then we have over here the uh, standard error uh, T value in an infinite case, in the OLS case, and the T values as they move over to the simple case. So we're going to report the, the least squares estimates and, uh, and the T values. And then over here, these are the S values. So I now have three S values, and the S values, the sturdy ones, are the ones that are in bold. 
And the, the, up at the top of this, it gives you the expected R squares, the interval of expected R squares that corresponds with these S values. So the, the first interval of, of uh, expected R squared is one of kind of indifference, which goes from 0.1 to 1, saying, I don't know how good these variables are. And the answer is, if that's your attitude, there's really nothing in this data set. Well, I, how about if I'm doubtful about their importance? So then my, my R squared, expected R squared goes from 0.1 to 0.5. Then that says, uh, well, th th that you got one sturdy coefficient. If you want to have sturdy coefficients, you have to have more diffuse priors. You have to have more, a higher expectation of the quality of this model. And then you have quite a few sturdies. Now, when you get to 67 variables, or 69, I forget what it is, which is the, one, the number of variables that have been used historically, the thing breaks down completely. You don't get any sturdy coefficients. So I think the, most economists don't find that, res, uh, that result surprising. But my point, again, is that we need to have uh, understandable, somewhat understandable. If you, if you read what I've written on SVIRs, it'll be a whole lot more clear than what I said today. But they're, at that some level, they're quite simple, where I'm taking the Bayesian prior distribution located at zero, meaning you think these coefficients are all doubtful. And then you have an upper and lower covariance bounds. Both of those bounds are proportional to the identity matrix using standardized variables. So all the covariances are not identity, are not the identity, they're not diagonal. They're anything that are bounded from above and below by those two intervals. And note that interval is characterized or created by the prior expected R squared. And then, and then uh, you, can, you can trace out that contract curve as well. That's what's happening here. So as you shrink in toward the origin, we're going to move from the infinite down to the zero. That's we're going to trace it out as things go. If we had more time, we could go through all the details here. So <clears throat> here's, an, here's an image that shows that uh, tracing. The, the one on the left is the OLS estimate. And the, the what's on the right, on the far right, I'm sorry, the one on the far left is the simple regression. The one on the far right is the OLS regression. And as you move to the left, that's shrinking in using that uh, spherical metric, shrinking in closer to the origin. You can see that one variable wants to change sign, which is the one down to the bottom per capita GDP. It's the one that seems kind of most fragile, as it should be. As it should be, because it's true that the, the rich get richer because they continue to invest in education and infrastructure. But if you control for uh, the initial conditions, you find out that there is technological transfer, too, particularly as we have the integrated global world where there's much more capital flows and much more uh, <coughs> uh, uh, product flows, and as a consequence, much more, more idea flows. So, and then um, these S values and T values are not that different. That's the final comment. I, I sort of started out that way. So here we have the T value on the horizontal, and then we, at the vertical we have these two S values, the 0.1 and a 0.5, corresponding to two different intervals. The one is a wider interval, the, and a, the one a smaller interval. The smaller interval gives you the higher S values, but the correlation stays the same. So in a way, uh, the, the traditional reporting isn't that bad, is what I'd say, because you just have to interpret that S value as a, as a sturdiness measure as well as statistical uncertainty. And this kind of confirms that point. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say. <laughs>